So um, this gives us the opportunity to talk about writing because um, writing for radio, it's quite a different medium. Uh, just talk about what, what sort of things you've been writing in recent years. Yeah, no, I found radio particular project quite challenging. I, I do quite a lot of visual work as well with video, so trying to put over concepts um, just with the dimension of sound has been uh, a bit of a struggle. In terms of uh, of writing, we uh, Roger and I have worked together several years now, haven't we? We've uh, done a few um, bit of performance poetry, bit of shadow puppetry, and a mix of weird and wonderful projects. I think. The one I most remember was Pigs Pigs Can't Fly down at the Garden Calf where we had a uh, flying pink pig as one of our props and I was uh, somebody at a call centre in India in a white coat That's right. driving yeah. you mad. I can't remember if it was, you were ahead of the time or, or where the call centres were, were as common as they are now uh, and as loved as they are now. I have to say. Yeah, that, that's something about. And then the other, the big project that you've been working on and, and I have to own up I, I got on track last year with, with the project you told me about, which was write uh, 50,000 words in a month. Yes, the uh, National Writer Novel in a Month project. Which we're in the middle of now, in November. We're nearly towards the end of it. Uh, indeed. I, I haven't entered this year, but um, last year that was an amazing project. Uh, I buddied that with uh, my mate Di, Aboriginal elder from northern Queensland, and we both egged each other on. We got our 1,600 words a day. Most of it I wrote on the numbers 27 bus, going from Camden to the city. And we achieved our target. And it's quite wonderful challenge. I'd recommend it to anyone. I believe they're doing it twice a year now. They really? do one in really? June yeah. as well, or April. I, I, got, I think I got a couple of thousand words in mm. my month. Yes, I remember. You were with us for the first few days, That's Roger. Right. But it, 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 it sort of worked because it's interesting because, I mean, writing is a skill, but, but words are out there for anyone, aren't they? You know, words, the property of words is, is actually just a matter of you choosing them to, to, to end up on a piece of paper. But the incentive, you know, the reason to write is often the most difficult thing. And I thought this was like just write as many words as you can and then try and make sense of it was a quite a different approach and, and, and I did find it, it worked. Yes, yeah, I mean having talked to some other people who are involved, the overriding thing was that many of the participants, I believe they have nearly a hundred thousand around the planet who join in on this, and of course many of them are not professional writers at all, they're, they're people who probably never written that many words in such a short period. And, you know, the feedback was that after you got through the pain of the first two days it started to flow. So I would certainly recommend it to anyone if they if they feel the need to write, enter the competition. The thing that I to mention was that last year you came down to London to join in the the, the, the Fed uh, yeah. annual festival of writing, which brings people from all across the UK and further afield together to just exchange and 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 sort of enjoy each other's company, but also ex swap skills and but it's all around writing. Yeah. No, we there were some amazing workshops that we ran. There was a uh, particular remember the comedy workshop. Were you in that one? No, I missed no. it. No, we uh, we were tasked to uh, to write what uh, the guy said was going to be the most difficult writing project you'll ever you'll ever do, and that is to write a comedy sitcom. And I agree with him. Yes. It was a total failure. We really thought the jokes were good, but they didn't come over in the mm. end. No, Comedy is hard work, it isn't it? Really is. Yes, it, you can see how much effort's involved there. It was. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a, a fair parallel, but th there was a program repeated last night on the telly where Frank Skinner was interviewing people about George Formby, and people were saying he was a comic, so he wanted to make everything just look easy and and, and accessible. But in fact, he was a very very good ukulele player. And there's a sense about that, about some aspects of writing. People think it's easy and, and you can get your book published and stuff. You just need the right advice. But actually, there's a lot more behind it. There is, indeed. It's not quite like picking up a ukulele. As I will be doing next Saturday, <laughs> by the way, there's a ukulele workshop. Oh, I've heard about this. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but since you, you, you wrote your 50,000 words last year, yep. 
you've been working on a much bigger piece of achievement, really. Tell us about your your novel. Yes, indeed. Um, my novel, which has been in formation for five years, like uh, many writers, I was blessed with the opportunity of uh, having some time off work this year, and it should be going out to the to the publishers probably in January. Um, and you, you've had positive feedback from from. I've had a lot of positive feedback from uh, from various agents and a um, lot of support from the people on the creative writing course from, at Bath University and uh, a lot of support from my partner and, and all of my friends of course yeah now as you say the, the, the ideas behind the novel have been five years and probably longer as you see other people's work coming out new novels new work and stuff like that that, that must be a bit of a fear that somebody else has somehow latched onto what you've been garnering and, and polishing as your special novel. Indeed, indeed, because, uh, and in fact, it, it has happened almost a couple of times in that five years. The novel is, is based on the story of a certain gentleman or group of people being sent to Tasmania for misdemeanours. And one of the characters is uh, Warren James, uh, the leader of the uh, enclosure rights in the forest in 1830. Now, the story has obviously uh, many twists and turns. I've actually seen people who have written stories about uh, people going to Australia in that period and read them avidly. Luckily, not the same concept, not as good as the black line. Read it when it comes out. Okay, so tell us about your book. Um, well, can I read you the synopsis? Because we've just finalised it. Okay. Yeah. Benjamin Robbins, an orphan brought up in the city of Gloucester, one of 220 convicts transported on the Elizabeth on the 3rd of October 1831, bound for Van Diemen's Land, befriends Warren James leader of the anti-enclosure riots in the Forest of Dean. The two men, from very different backgrounds, form a bond that ensures their survival through the hardships of convict life and their involvement in the Black Wars of Tasmania, where they are saved from starvation by the last desperate survivors of the Pinterera nation and learn the true meaning of kinship. As the group gradually succumbs to the ravages of disease and genocide, they all come to rely on each other for moral support, as the inevitability of their eventual extinction gradually dawns on them. The story brings the reader slowly but inexorably to the conclusion that kinship and belief in one's ancestors is man's true destiny and is as alive and meaningful today as it was in the 19th century. The Black Line is a work of speculative fiction with an important message for 21st century readers. That's it. Okay, so that goes on the back. That's the one to draw people in. Indeed, yes. Um, and so you, 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 you unwind this story from when they meet on the boat. Mm. Over, over what period of time? Um, well, Warren survived till 1842, I think, so about 10 years. Okay. Yeah. So do you want to read us an extract? Give us a, a flavour of the, of, the, of the text from the book? Just, Cu just a taste? A couple of little, like couple of little bits, okay. Yeah. Nagarawandi stood pensively, spear in hand, right foot crooked gently on left knee, listening to the jabber of the bleached ones stumbling around like toddlers in the Wiradu snake valley below. How can these creatures communicate with each other, he wonders. They never look into each other's eyes. As he watches their unruly brawling and aggressive shaking of identically shaped shards of quartz crystal at each other, he starts to see a pattern in their strange lurches and gestures. This must be some traditional dance to celebrate a past battle, he concludes. Maybe a ceremony to determine who will be the leader in their next encounter. The short, overfed one on the right appears to be the dominant character in this strange opera, shouting down each one of the group in turn 
establishing his superiority. Mm. Anyway, the best way I can give you a feel for the Aboriginal voice in the book is probably to play your track from Goodaba. Uh, they were a group that both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal kids from the Bulawai people formed when they and my kids were at school together. Uh, Astro Brim, the lead singer, went on to become a UN youth ambassador, actually, for the Aboriginal nations in New York. Um, I'll let him give you the message. Because you've lived in, in Australia with, with native people. How long and how did that happen? Um, well, we emigrated with the two kids in 87. And um, when uh, little Rummy, the baby, came along, uh, the only people that would help us were the local Aboriginal community because it was about an hour to get to the hospital. And when we got there, they, uh, they wouldn't let them into the hospital grounds. Really? That was Australia in 1988 when Romy was born. So that was, a, 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 I suppose, quite a shock to, to what you've been used to in terms of values and, and judgments. I mean, it's going back to the, what we see as, as the, the distant past, you know, although it's not only 1960s in America. 
Yes, indeed. Um, it was uh, it was a, also a, a great bonding experience, and um, obviously uh, our family are now sort of um, honorary members of the Bulawai tribe, <laughs> and um, you know they all our kids played in bands together, and uh, you know obviously none of the Aboriginal kids got the opportunity to go to university, but. Uh, they they do go and play down in uh, some of the university halls, amazingly enough, and meet up with my kids. Yeah. Only now I appreciate it when we went to see that film at Colford Cinema about the Aborigines passing on the skills of carving canoes from trees. Hmm. How real and how close you've been to that in reality? Well, the uh, Bellawai people are a, a, a coastal people, so they have quite a, uh, a long canoe making history. They use a single rigger outrig. Uh, we're very similar to, uh, in more similar to Indonesia. Um, in Papua New Guinea they tend to have the double outriggers. So there's, uh, but yeah, some of the old boys still know how to do it, yeah. <laughs> okay, we better move on. So, uh, thank you Nigel.